Thank you for all who are watching us on Zoom right now. We are just getting our live streams going to Facebook and YouTube and are launching right now. And just want to make sure that everyone has a chance to get in and be able to see the live streams. And we are live on Facebook. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the fifth Coast Guard Tech Talks workshop. These workshops are jointly sponsored by the US Coast Guard, the Coast Guard Auxiliary, and the Boy Scouts of America's Sea Scout program. My name is Bruce Johnson, and I serve as chief of the Coast Guard Auxiliary's youth programs. Our co-host is Josh Gilliland, chair of the National Sea Scout Communications and Marketing Team. Josh will be coordinating your questions in the third part of the program. Coast Guard Tech Talks are held monthly on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 2100 Eastern, 2000 Central, 1900 Mountain, and 1800 Pacific Time. Each program focuses on a single science, technology, engineering, mathematics, or STEM topic. These topics are chosen to support the Sea Scout Advancement Program. Next month's Tech Talks workshop will be Radio, Ordinary Requirement 5 Echo. Tonight's topic is ra Radar Navigation. Our presenter is Lieutenant Brent Lane, an active duty member of the U United States Coast Guard. Lieutenant Lane was born and raised in Northeastern Pennsylvania and was exposed to sea stories early in life by his two grandfathers and his uncle, all of whom served in the Navy. He, was, he is a 2013 graduate of the US Coast Guard Academy with a Bachelor of Science degree in government. Brent has served aboard three Coast Guard cutters in Wilmington, North Carolina, Newport, Rhode Island, and Pensacola, Florida. While deploying on these cutters, he participated in counter narcotics, migration interdiction, fisheries enforcement, and aids to navigation maintenance. He currently serves as a seamanship and navigation instructor at the US Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. One last thing, we've muted your microphones to make it easier for everyone to hear. If you have questions, please type them in the chat box. Ja Josh will be monitoring chat and will be sure to leave time to answer your question. So let's get, get uh, let's welcome Lieutenant Brent Lane. Thank you very much for the uh, great introduction. I am uh, Lieutenant Brent Lane and it's an honor to be here tonight for the Coast Guard Tech Talk and work through some radar navigation. The uh, PowerPoint that I have for you tonight is courtesy of the United States Naval Academy Seamanship and Navigation Department. And uh, this is a course that they actually go through at the uh, junior level at the Naval Academy. So congratulations to all of you that are working through these qualifications and learning some of these great skills early on in life. This is radar navigation. So radar, or radio detection and ranging was developed during the early 1900s. And we started to see some military applications 1935 uh, for beyond visual range detection of objects. And it really provided Britain's Royal Air Force and an air superiority over Germany during World War II. This is where the myth that carrots give you really good eyesight came from. The British developed radar and were able to detect radio uh, aerial raids over Britain very early in advance. 
and what they said was that they were able to see very easily because their pilots ate a lot of carrots. However, they were using radar to see those planes appear over the horizon before they were actually within sight of their British cities. So how does radar work? It has transmission and reception of radio or EM waves, electromagnetic waves. The EM waves travel at the speed of light and we use a calculation of distance equals time divided by speed, which three times 10 to the eighth power is our speed of light. And we have applications in all environments, primarily for us, contact detection, targeting, and navigation. We're going to change our frequency or our pulse length for a desired range and image resolution. We're going to really change that if we are in a harbor, we're going to uh, want to see things very close. Whereas if we're out in open ocean, we may want to see things before they come over the horizon. So we need to expand how far we can see on that radar. And then navigation radars usually have a high frequency and low pulse length, which causes them to have higher resolution, but shorter range versus our uh, weather that our weather radar that is going to have the opposite, which is a further range. The reflection of those EM waves is received and amplified and processed by the radar into an image. So in plain language, what's happening is this image here is the electromagnetic wave is going out, bouncing off of an object and coming back, the echo is being detected by the radar sensor. That distance is being determined by the time it took for that electromagnetic wave to travel, bounce off of an object and come back so that we can use our radar to tell how far something away is. So for a radar standard components on any type of radar that you're gonna see at sea, you're gonna see a transmitter which produces the electromagnetic, wave, electromagnetic waves of energy, the duplexer which isolates the receiver from the transmitter while permitting them to share a common antenna, the antenna itself is transmitting the outgoing pulses and receiving the returning echoes. And then the receiver is amplifying the return echoes and demodulating them for display onto our display. So we're generating those electromagnetic like magnetic waves here in our transmitter, going through the duplexer, out through the antenna. It's bouncing off of an object. We're doing a time speed distance calculation coming back through the antenna, through the duplexer, into the receiver, which then gives us a really nice display that we can tell what we're seeing, not just electromagnetic waves. So characteristics of the radar. We have a pulse length, which is the transmit period, and it ensures the radar transmits sufficient power to generate a detectable echo. If we're not putting out enough of that pulse length, we may not be able to bounce off of the objects that we wanna see. Pulse repetition frequency, which is the number of pulses per second, a greater PRF reduces the time available to listen, but longer ranges are required for lower PRFs. So if we are putting out more pulses, those pulses are gonna to start to get processed. So if we see something on one pulse, it will show up on our radar. However, if there's more time in between our pulses, it will stay on our radar longer. If it's something that's bouncing up and down in between the waves and we only saw it on one pulse and have a second pulse come back through and it misses it because it's below a wave, it's gonna disappear off our radar. So there's costs and benefits to having a shorter pulse or less pulses or more pulses. And then transmission frequency. So a higher transmission frequency means we have short range and better resolution, whereas a lower transmission frequency means we have a longer range but poorer resolution. So typically with this lower transmission frequency, we can see things over the horizon much easier and we're gonna be able to detect those 400 foot vessels that are made of metal are gonna have a really good signature for our radar to bounce off of. The higher, the short range, that's what we're gonna to wanna to adjust if we're looking for the small boats, the fishing vessels, the uh, sailboats that might be a fiberglass hull that are small and nearby so that we can detect those and make sure that we don't run into them. 
Typically higher frequency is used for fire control radar in a military world and for imaging so that we can see a coastline, whereas that lower frequency is ground penetrating radar or counter stealth radar, which we'll get into a little bit more. Maximum and minimum ranges. So every radar has its capabilities. Sometimes you're gonna have different settings that you wanna um, use. So for minimum, the minimum is determined by the pulse length. So radar cannot receive a returning echo until the trailing edge of the pulse has cleared the antenna and the transmit receive switch has been switched to receive. Maximum is determined by the frequency, peak power, pulse length, and pulse repetition, usually limited by the curvature of the earth to line of sight or slightly greater. So for our minimum, we need to be able to not overshoot something. Sometimes something is so close to us that we're not able to see it. And then we also want to make sure that the returning echo is coming back to us. For the maximum, we can only see something from this curvature of the earth or line of sight. Sometimes if something is tall enough over the curvature of the earth, we're going to be able to see it, or we may be able to get a little bit of a return, but generally, if we have a radar higher up off of the water, we'll be able to get that more uh, maximum range. Some common settings that you're gonna see on your radar on most military ships and civilian radars is a rain setting. So a rain you can set from most often a zero to 100. It's going to tune your radar to get rid of some atmospheric feedback. So if you are having lower clouds, you're going to want to increase your rain setting and see clutter, you can again adjust from like a zero to 100. And if you have a higher C state, you're gonna to wanna to adjust that. The way that this was explained to me that just made a lot of sense and really clicked is on your radar, you've got it coming out in a very wide angle. If you have rain coming down and you've got a lot of uh, low lying clouds, you can adjust your rain down to focus that beam on the radar. The same is true for the C clutter. If you've got a very nice flat C, you're gonna keep your C at zero and those radio waves are gonna be able to travel along the flat ocean. But if your C state's picking up and you're in somewhere around seven or eight foot C's and it's very choppy, you're gonna to wanna to pick the band of your radar up off and narrow it from the bottom up so that you have a more narrow set of that radar so that you can see a little bit clearer and not have rain or sea state clog up your uh, radar display. And then your gain is your amplification of return. So a lot of times if you have that gain up, you're gonna have what looks like this picture in the bottom right as well. A lot of return, it's gonna come back things that aren't actually vessels. So you can adjust that gain until you get a really nice clear picture. And the radar itself, video image, is determined by these settings like we talked about. So when you're at sea and you're trying to determine what you're uh, trying to find something, changing these settings is very, very useful. Uh, when I was at sea and we wanted to avoid large commercial vessels, it's pretty easy to see a 400 foot tanker that is metal and you have this radar bouncing off of it. Very, very clear picture. However, when we're trying to find people that are running drugs and they're using low profile vessels or it's a migrant vessel that's weighed down and only has a freeboard of about a foot and might be made out of wood, you really have to get in and edit these settings and adjust that gain to make sure that you're dealing with the correct settings for your atmosphere and your sea state so that you can see the vessel that you're trying to find. And it really is an art. The people that have the most experience and get in there and mess with that radar the most to learn what its settings should be in the prevailing atmosphere are the ones that have the most success at sea finding those small vessels. This is an example of our gain here with the gain turned all the way up. We can see the green is our return from those radar electromagnetic waves. The black is where we're not getting anything. So we're gonna adjust our gain for a little bit of a better setting. 
And what we can see is here we're pulling into Annapolis Harbor, where over here to the left side of the screen, we've got the Naval Academy. We've got where the Yard Patrol craft are moored up here. Really good defined sea coast where some of these are piers, some of these are beaches. But we've adjusted that gain so that we're seeing positively whether these are boats or buoys and the shoreline, we don't have a lot of clutter mocking up where there's not actually any contacts. Sea clutter. So what happens when you are using your radar is the first thing that that electromagnetic wave bounces off of, it's going to come back and that electromagnetic wave isn't going to go any further because it's already bounced off of something. So if you have a lot of sea clutter, we can see here on the left a really good picture, where on the right it's not so good. If there's a small vessel near us within these first couple range rings, we're probably not going to see it because it's messed up in the sea clutter. Because all those electromagnetic, electromagnetic waves are bouncing off of the first waves that they hit and coming back. That also makes everything out beyond unreliable unless it's higher than that sea state. So we've here adjusted our sea clutter to bring those electromagnetic waves above the prevailing sea state so that they're not bouncing off the first waves they hit and they can actually go out and hit some vessels or some buoys and bounce back to us and give us a good navigation picture of what we're seeing. Rain looks like this, where we've got that a little bit further away from us. What's happening is the electromagnetic waves are going through the rain at first but they're getting so degraded to the point that eventually they hit enough rain droplets, they hit a concentration of rain, that then they're coming back to us. So you're gonna get this clogging of your picture further away. On the right, we've got a very nicely tuned radar where we still have the rain. It's not, it's gonna be almost impossible to get rid of all of it, but we have a clearer picture on the right here of maybe some vessels that are in the bottom left corner, maybe a buoy that's up here on the right, these would have been a lot harder to pick out in this clogged picture on a radar that has a lot of rain around it. So for our maritime applications, we're gonna use it for navigation, spatial awareness, and anti-collision. A lot of weapon systems will be linked in with your radar. We're gonna use it for aircraft control and weather detection. This aircraft carrier has their SPS-48 antenna at the highest point possible. We talked about the higher up it is, the further range it's going to have because it can see over that curvature of the earth. Imagine you're swimming in the ocean. Your eyes are about eight to 12 inches above the water line. You can only see about a mile or two miles. You're still gonna see a horizon, but it's only about a mile or two miles away from you. This aircraft carrier with a height at this radar antenna of probably about 200 feet off the water is going to actually see a horizon that's maybe 20 to 22 nautical miles away from where it is. So although you're seeing a horizon, the distance you are off the water line is just much further away the higher you are up. So we want to get that radar antenna as high off the water line as we can so that it has as high of a range as possible. We've got a nice picture on the top right here of a radar that's doing some navigation and anti-collision awareness for us. We can see where our coastlines are and some inbound and outbound vessels that we're tracking. We've got on the uh, bottom here, an aircraft uh, control radar. So we've got our uh, plane in the center and it's uh, detecting some clouds coming up through it. And it's, at, and it's got some other aircraft that are on there as well. So for navigation, what we're going to do is we can actually do a radar LOP. I think that everybody in this group should be aware of what an LOP is, but if you're not, it's a line of position. And if we have three lines of position, we can get a fix. So what we can do with radar is we can get a range to a known object. If that object is on our chart, like a day board and we can detect it on our radar, we can determine our range and then go to our paper chart, swing a range to it, and we can get our first LOP 
for determining a fix. For anti-collision, we're going to detect and track contacts. The radar is going to be able to give us our CPA or our closest point of approach. It's going to be able to give us our time to our closest point of approach so that we can know the relative motion between two vessels, how close are we going to get? And many radars are actually equipped with a feature where you can say, if you make a certain movement, if you make a uh, course change, what is going to happen for your situation? Are you going to increase your closest point of approach or will that actually bring the two vessels closer together for an intercept? And then rules of the road. We, uh, we say that we need for rules of the road to use all available means. We need to use radar for plotting and safe speed considerations. So if we're in restricted visibility, we're in a very foggy day on the bay, but we have radar, we can still detect other vessels and make good decisions about what we're seeing, which is not much, only what we're seeing on the radar, but also correlating sound signals to the radar. So if we're hearing buoys or we're hearing other vessels making noises, we can take those sound signals, correlate them to our radar, and then correlate them to our chart to make sure that we're still navigating with all available means. Targeting and fire control. If we can lock onto a vessel or an aircraft with radar, then we can use some further technology to make sure that our missiles or our bullets land on target where they're supposed to. Advantages of radar. We talked about how it determines the range of objects, which can then get us LOPs and a fix. You can use radar during the daytime, the nighttime, or low visibility. And then your fixes may be determined at greater distances from land than by visual means. So our radars can go over the horizon slightly. So if we know that we have a rocky cliff or we have a day board and we can't necessarily see it with our eyes or shoot it with our Allidade, we can still use our radar, hopefully, to be able to get that fix. We can do a calculation of the position, which may be obtained from just a single object. You can be doing a running fix, and you can, it can be used to detect the presence of heavy precipitation. A lot of times at sea, you can see that rain coming in. You have your rain set somewhere between 0 and 10 percent. You can start to see that rain coming in even before it's over the horizon, and you know that you need to start making adjustments in case there's somebody out there painting, they thought it was a nice day, maybe they need to wrap it up or we can avoid so that they don't get uh, fresh water rain down all over their paint. However, there are a lot of disadvantages, or advantages, but we've got some disadvantages to radar too. It can be subject to mechanical and electrical failure. So if you're not on a ship that has electronics technicians or somebody that's proficient in fixing the radar, then you yourself, I hope, is proficient in reading through a manual to figure out and troubleshoot what's going on when it's not operating the way that you expect it to. It does have its maximum and minimum ranges. And then sometimes interpretation of the delay of the display is not always easy. We don't want to make assumptions based off of scanty radar information. And that is something that the rules of the road points out very specifically, that if we think that we're seeing something, but it's scanty radar information, we don't want to assume that what we're seeing is a boat or assume that a vessel made a course change because a radar says it kind of looks like it did. Small objects, especially in high sea states, may not be detected. We talked about how if that boat is coming up onto the top of a crest of a wave and then going down into the trough of a wave. If it's down in the trough of a wave, that electromagnetic wave is just going to bounce right over it and not see it. If it's at the crest of the wave, the electromagnetic wave may bounce off of it and come back, but then it's going to disappear. So it really depends on what your pulse rate is to see if that vessel is going to stay. A lot of times on a radar that's called persistence and a vessel detected or just a detection will stick around on the screen after multiple pulse rates, even though you uh, aren't detecting it anymore. It has a persistence so that it sticks around just a little bit longer, hoping that maybe you can detect it again and correlate its movement. And then it also requires transmission from the ship, which may not be tactically desirable. There are people out there that can counter detect by radar. We're not gonna get into this on a live stream, but if you're trying to not be detected, you are using something that's emitting an electromagnetic pulse. 
its limitations as well. So it's got blind arcs and blank sectors. So we got this nice picture of a vessel down here. This vessel actually has th four radars on it so that it doesn't miss any sectors. We can see that if we cut down and only had two of these, we would have these pieces of the pie that we would be missing. So we overkilled it on this vessel and we put about four radars on so that the only spots that we're missing are the ones that are actually on the vessel. Most vessels, most military vessels will have a minimum of two, a forward radar and an aft radar to make sure that we're not missing anything. But what you wanna be cognizant of is if you're trying to see something behind you, you wanna use the aft radar because then you don't have the mast in between you and the radar. If you're trying to see something in front of you, you wanna use the forward radar because then again, the mast is behind you and you have a clear unobstructed view of your electromagnetic waves going off the ship. Sea and rain states can affect your radar performance and there's EM transmission hazards. A lot of times if we had radar problems at sea, we would need to send our electrician or electronics technicians aloft to go and fix those issues. Well, to fix those issues, we have to secure the radar. Otherwise, they're getting electromagnetic waves pulsed into their bodies. So it's unfortunate that if you're having an issue, you have to secure the whole system in order to fix it. So hopefully you have some sort of backup that you can be working that's not going to harm the technicians that are working on it, and you can still have some sort of a radar picture. And then bearing resolution can be poor depending on what you're trying to see. So we can see that in this picture on the bottom left, we're transiting in what is Annapolis Harbor. Most likely this corner here, they're gonna be using as a radar aid. Well, if we're not detecting it the right way or there's a boat moored up at that pier, it may be hard to see exactly what we're looking at because we don't wanna use radar nav aids that are beyond the uh, pier faces or the shoreline. Anything that's inland, you're not gonna be able to use as a radar nav aid. For contact tracking, we usually have embedded software that allows automatic or manual tracking. Sometimes if you have a vessel come up, it'll automatically cue it as a vessel. Other times you have to acquire that yourself. So you still have to pay attention to your radar to make sure that new contacts that are arriving you're acquiring so that you can get their CPA, TCPA like we talked about, but also their course, their speed, their range, and their bearing. And then a lot of times radars will have the AIS overlay so that if it is an AIS contact, you can not only get the information of CPA and TCPA from its AIS, but you can compare that to its uh, information from its radar. Understanding that the information the radar is giving you is going to be different than the information the AIS is giving you. If that's a 400 foot vessel, its AIS transponder is probably on its bridge, but where you're getting an a the radar signature from maybe 300 feet away from that AIS signature up on its bow. So understand that if you're using radar, don't rely solely on the AIS overlay. And if you have an AIS overlay, don't rely solely on the radar signature. You wanna compare and contrast both. Thank you. Well done. We actually do have some questions already. Great. And uh, first one up is, can you combine forward and aft radars into a composite image? So in my experience, no. When we have a forward and an aft radar, we typically have two different displays. And we're seeing that so because those um, that whole setup of the receiver and the antenna, it's two different receivers, it's two different antennas. So that's gonna be coming down into two different displays on your bridge. So um, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you're monitoring both of those so that you're seeing the full spatial awareness. Excellent. Second question is, what is the difference between radar and satellite? All right, so radar is, what we're using is electromagnetic waves, like I mentioned, that are being emitted from our ship to detect objects. Satellites are an array of um, machinery in the sky that are orbiting around us. And they are, um, that's using primarily for communications. Um, we're, not tip, we're not generally doing um, 
detection of objects on the water with satellites, um, you can use satellite navigation to get GPS positions, but your radar is primarily going to be able to give you that understanding of what is around you because your electromagnetic waves are detecting it from your location. Thank you. So for others who have questions, please don't be shy. Uh, type them into the Q&A tool and we'll do our best to, to answer them. One of the questions that we have is, uh, marine radar the same as the radar weather forecasters use? Great. great. Um, so marine radar is going to be used in a way that we want to detect ships and things that are close to us, um, generally closer down to the waterline. And a lot of times marine radars are built so that they're not detecting rain as much, whereas the Doppler radar that you're seeing on your nightly news is going to be adjusted so that it does pick up on rain more often. So where we talked about being able to get rid of some of that rain feature, the Doppler radar on your nightly news is actually going to be tuned specifically to bounce off of the uh, rainstorm as it's moving across to get you a good understanding of those weather systems. So another question, can radar hurt you if you're within its beam? Yeah, so radar can hurt you. Um, it is an electromagnetic pulse and it is a form of radiation um, that it radiates out at you. Um, you can have problems if you are exposed to it for a very long time. I would say if you've had a you know, under 10 minutes of exposure, you're probably good. But if you're working with radar over a long period of time, you know, daily for long, for many years, you may have issues. Um, what we've done in the Coast Guard, it's a common courtesy, is if we're doing a personnel transfer and we have a small boat pull up alongside our cutter, we typically ask them to turn their radar off as they're making their approach. Um, because most of the time on a small boat, that radar is going to be right about at our main deck and it would be hitting our people right in the chest. So a uh, common courtesy that if someone's going to be exposed to your radar, you should secure it. Now let's talk stealth. How does stealth technology avoid radar? And as a bonus question, where was the stealth ship built? Okay. Um, so stealth technology is using two different options that I'm aware of. One option is special paint that absorbs the electromagnetic pulses so that it's never given the opportunity to bounce back to the receiver and be detected. The other option is that they put so many strange angles into the aircraft or into the ship that when that electromagnetic wave bounces off, it's not gonna bounce back to the receiver, it's gonna bounce back in a strange way and never make it back to the receiver. So it's either being absorbed or deflected. Now for where the first stealth ship was built, I can take a guess and say Bath, Maine, but that's just a guess. Correct answer, Redwood City, California. All right. <laughs> By three Sea Scout ships, so <laughs> why we know that. Uh, there's another question. In your experience, how much does ocean swell affect radar return and is it, is it affected by vessel size? Yeah, so it definitely depends first on what ocean you're in. Um, for anybody that's sailed both in the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean, you'll know that the swell is a lot different between those two. In the Atlantic Ocean, the period between your waves is a lot shorter. So it's a lot rougher. You get a lot more slamming in like a 10 foot sea state. In the Pacific, you could be in 10 foot seas. And because that period is so much longer, it's like a nice general roll that's just rocking you to sleep. So for a higher sea state in the Pacific, it's not gonna affect as much. Whereas in the Atlantic, those small boats can really get down and hide in between and you have a lot more waves coming up and, and hitting. Um, it does affect, smaller boats are gonna be able to hide in between the trough and the crest of a wave a lot easier. And the, hot, the bigger your radar is, the higher up it is, 
you may actually overshoot some of that. Um, so you want to adjust your C, uh, your C setting on your radar so that it's not bouncing off those C waves and the crests of the waves that are as close to your boat. Thank you. So uh, any other questions? So we will, uh, again, keep the line open just for another minute. But while people are talking, uh, Bruce, why don't you share what's coming up next? Sure. And... Um, I'm happy to. Thank you. Um, next month, we're going to have a presentation on marine radio. Uh, the uh, presentation will be on October 27th at our usual time. Same time, same bat station. Um, and for this evening's uh, workshop, we do have a project that we'll be posting on the Oxby Wiki website and we'll provide a link to that from both the Sea Scouts BSA uh, Facebook page as well as the Ox Scout Facebook page. Uh, it's not there yet, but we'll get it up tomorrow and let everybody know that it's available. Uh, Josh, I see that we have another question that's come in. Yes, do you have some channel radar return images available? Uh, I'm, I don't think I understand the question, channel, like... Uh... That is a good question. Let's see if they revise it. If they mean channel, like entering a channel or uh, another term for channel, I might not know what they mean. So if you're operating in a channel? Um... Channel marker, so yes. Okay, channel marker, okay. Yeah, so channel markers are gonna be a little bit uh, you know, closer to the water, so you're gonna wanna make sure that your C is lower. Um, hopefully, if you're operating near channel markers, you're not in a high C state where you would have a higher, greater opportunity of being thrown into shoal water. Um, but, you know, lower sea states so that you can see the channel markers closer to the water. Um, and then you want your gain to be adjusted in a way that's comfortable to you. Really, it's about getting out there. There's so many different types of radar. On my three ships alone, I've operated on five different types of radar, and they've all had different settings. It's about talking to the people that were on the ship before you that are qualified on the ship that you're working on and ask them what their favorite settings are. And then when you're standing watch, work with that radar to tweak it in and make sure you're seeing what you wanna be seeing. Um, the other thing I would say is before you get underway from the pier, it's a great opportunity to work with that radar. You're gonna be shooting on land. So off one side of the ship, all you're gonna be seeing is land and it's not gonna be a good picture. But on the waterway side of that radar, you should have some buoys, you should have some, uh, some day boards, potentially bridges, um, far away sea coasts or uh, shorelines. So use that opportunity before you get underway to tune in that radar to your specific environment to make sure that you know, it's what you see, what you're seeing is what you're actually seeing out the window and that you're comfortable with it before you pull away from the pier. Excellent, thank you. So, oh, we have another. And so I'll read the sentence because I'm not sure exactly what it means, but also I wonder if I could converse offline. Oh, convert, okay, just wants to ask questions. They'll send us a question to the email address for where you registered and we'll be happy to, to relay those questions. So, um, Yes, so everyone, thank you for attending tonight. Uh, Lieutenant, thank you for your time. I know thank it's you. good on the East Coast. And uh, everyone, we will have uh, be back next month. We're also gonna get a piloting, uh, able piloting webinar scheduled that, that's ready to go. So watch for that in early October as well. So lots of great things happening. And now back to Bruce Johnson. Yes, and thank you very much, Lieutenant and Josh, for your help with this evening's uh, presentation. Uh, I'd like to uh, mention to those of those in the audience who are uh, auxiliaries that we will be restarting the Ox Scout uh, workshops 
uh, uh, later in October. Uh, some of them will be repeats from last year, but some of them will be best practice presentations on how to do things in sea scouting, things like uh, how to recruit, how to uh, teach certain topics. Um, so uh, have a look at both, well, at the Auk Scout uh, Facebook page, uh, and we will be uh, announcing that availability. And uh, for those of you who haven't already, but are planning, but would like to, the um, uh, East Coast Safety at Sea event that normally would be at the Curtis Bay Coast Guard Yard uh, is being held as a virtual event on November 7th uh, from nine to three Eastern time and there still is room if you'd like to register. There's a very small fee for the, uh, for the event, but you'll be getting a patch for that as well. You'll also be helping to pay for the uh, internet connectivity. And we have a great set of uh, speakers and videos lined up. You'll have a, a great time with it. So thank you everyone for uh, attending this evening. And we will have a recording of this available in the next few days. And uh, please come back next month uh, for our workshop on marine radios. So good night. <laughs>